How do we know, before we go into the Torah, how do we know God exists? We cannot prove that He exists with the five senses that he, we have. We can't smell Him, we can't taste Him, we can't see Him, we can't hear Him, we can't touch Him. In that case, how can we prove that He exists? The answer to that is, you see the creation, you're learning about the Creator. The more sophisticated is the creation, it indicates about the brilliance and the ability of the great Creator. We have a rule in life. Everything that we're going to see and to hold in our hand, every creation that we ever approach in our life, a laptop, a projector, a table, a chair, a light bulb, anything, you name it, anything that was ever created, we know that if there is a creation, there has to be a creator. Coming to say that this beautiful creation with billions of stars, galaxies, oxygen, water, everything, people, animals, two million different kinds of animals, trees, flowers, so many brilliant things in a creation. Coming to claim that something like this happened with a random explosion and everything started to expand out of nowhere and, and then it started to develop with certain evolution and one thing leads to another, it's also not exactly clever to claim such a claim. But when the professors are saying it in university, everybody buys it. They live with that, they learned it, they got to test on it, they pass the test, and then they become professor, and excuse my language, they continue to teach this nonsense to another 10 million people, and they will teach it to 100 million people, and I promise you, not even one of them believe what he's preaching. Why? Every normal human being know if there is a chair, there must be a carpenter. I don't know him, but I'm willing to swear on my life that the carpenter made it. If there is a laptop, there's some kind of Japanese engineer that made it. I'm willing to swear on it. I don't have to know him. If I go to the moon and I see a Coca-Cola cane, I know somebody was there before me. He didn't get there by itself. If there is a creation, there must be a creator. The more brilliant the creation is, it indicates that the Creator is more brilliant. To make a chair, you don't need to be a genius. One day of training and you know how to make a chair. To make an F-16 airplane, you need 20 years of training. It's not enough one day. Why? It's a very sophisticated machine. The more clever the machine is, the more ability the Creator has. When we review a human brain, we take one brain, size of an apple, 10 trillion connection inside this little piece of jelly, 80% jelly, 20% raw material, 10 trillion connection in this little box. If we take all the telephone companies in the world, include all the satellites, Every wire out there, include all satellites of all the countries in the world combined, it's not 1% of the dumbest person in the world. Take the dumbest person in the world, his brain is 100 times greater than all the telecommunication companies, include internet, all over the world. Just one brain of one person. Multiplied by 7 billion people in this generation, go back hundreds of generations before, Take millions and millions of different monkeys, take all the two million different species, they all have brains, everything is connected, people have feelings, people have memory, everything is very, very sophisticated. Not to talk about the rest of the creation, I'm not even going into the galaxies and all the rest of the movements of all the galaxy, everything is in order, nothing collides, there is a supervision of every inch of the creation. To come and deny it, you can say whatever you want, but let's not fool ourselves. I don't believe there's one person in a history that really believed that everything was made by itself and there's no supervisor. It's not realistic. Did you ever see 
any creation point one ever in history, anywhere in the world, in any culture, in any country, in any language, any kind of creation that was made by anyone that did not have a purpose. If the most sophisticated creation is the world and mainly the human being, and his brain and liver and heart and veins and the nerve system and thousands of thousands of different systems in his body. It's a beautiful creation, a great machine with gr unbelievable abilities. Is it possible that the creator made the human being without a purpose? Is it possible that he made him just like that for no reason? It's not realistic. There has to be a reason. So that leads us to the next question. What good is the answer that there is a purpose to the life of a human being without knowing what it is? Did you ever see in life a normal human being that it doesn't bother him, what am I doing in this world? 6.4 billion people, so many people running around, business, marriage, children, animals, food, all kinds of things. What am I doing here? The creator that put me here, what does he want from me? Why did he give me seven years of life? Is it possible that this creator, which is so sophisticated, he puts us here with a purpose and never bothered to tell us the purpose. Nobody ever knew the purpose. Nobody knows what to do. So what are we living for? What's the point of living? Why dying? Why living? Why being sick? Why being rich? Why being poor? Get married, have children, not get married, suffer. What's all this? Has a reason, a purpose without, without any, any instructions? Of course not. The rule, the first rule is that if there is a book that was given by the creator of the world to people, if we're going to find one mistake in that book, one human error, from that moment on, it's not gonna be wise to continue to waste time on that book. You can read it if you're curious, but obviously you cannot continue to claim that this book is divine. Why? People like Albert Einstein and other genius people, as genius as they may be, they make mistakes. No one is perfect. But when the book claimed to be the book of God, we expect God to be a superpower that is completely perfect. If it's capable of making human errors, we cannot rely on one word of what he say. Because if he tells me that I have to put the feeling every day, maybe it's his second mistake. If he tells me that I have to observe the Sabbath, and for that is going to reward me greatly, maybe it's a second mistake. If he tells me to get married, maybe that's his second mistake. How can I rely on him after he already proven to me once that he's able to make mistakes? It's enough that I find one time that he made such like geographical mistake, mathematical mistake, contradiction in his books, in the chapters. One time he said one number and the next chapter he said a different number. So that's a memory problem. From that moment on, I cannot rely on that book. My next step right now is, now I come and I throw a bomb here. What is my bomb? I claim, I claim, that there is one book in history, only one, that was given to millions of people in a public event. They have one representative, one representative from them, which was Moshe ben Amra, Moses in English. Moses spoke to God. God gave him the Torah in front of millions of people from the nation of Israel. This is before Israel became Israel. We were first the Hebrews at that moment. After the Torah was given, we became the Jews. Their Jewish religion officially started. We 
are the only religion who started in front of millions of witnesses. We didn't believe a story of a person who came from nowhere and told us God spoke to me or gave me a book. No, absolutely not. The opposite, when God came to Moses and he told him, go and save the nation of Israel out of Egypt, they're all slaves, the answer of Moses was, anyway, they won't believe me that you spoke to me. They'll say I'm a liar. And God didn't get angry at him. What did he tell him? They're right. Why should they believe you? Just because you come and say that I spoke to you, they should believe you? No. I will speak to you in public, in front of all of them. When you bring them around the mountain, and after that, they'll be leaving you for eternity. And that's exactly what happened.